Today is January 30th, 2023, and you're listening to the Ask a Christian podcast. I'm your host, Nate. Culturally evangelizing. So what does that look like? Uh, how, should we take on someone else's culture, like Paul says? Uh, you know, he became like uh, the people he was he was witnessing to, or, you know, when in Rome. Or should we just be ourselves? Let's chat about it. Bible translation bias. The different uh, different versions or translations of the Bible. Not versions, translations. Um, do they have biases? Which way are they leaning? How do we know? How can we possibly find out? And the question everyone has been wondering, why can Amish people use forklifts but not electricity? Stay tuned. So find us wherever podcasts are found. Google the Ask a Christian podcast, a religious discussion. Find our Ask a Christian book on Amazon, now available. Until next time. Then you can learn the culture and not play the ugly American. What do you think? Well, I think, well, I think you could do that. So I think, <laughs> I, I guess Americans are just good at it. I mean, I don't travel a lot, so I don't know. So maybe I'm one of the good Americans. <laughs> and no one will know because I don't go invade other people's cultures. Um, but... Uh, so yeah, I guess if you if you want to assimilate, then you can learn their culture and do that. Or um, I, I guess you just kind of take my approach, where I'm like I'm I'm me, right? Just just me, which is which is pretty tame. So I think as far as like culturally speaking, so I'm not just uh, you know oozing. I, I mean maybe I am. Maybe this is about to prove me wrong. But I like to think I'm not just oozing obnoxious American, um, like this pompous, rebellious. I don't know, just egotistical whatever person which right there means maybe i am but I, I like to think i don't i don't present that way so um it's kind of like culturally neutral like you know even though i don't go seek other people out people from all over the world come in here every day and i'm like well well look i i just tell what i believe and why i believe it so it's like a bible culture not a not a geographic culture or something like that so i mean i, th I think it would be nice uh if everyone could just have a little bit of humility and, uh, you know, not be so, I guess, pompous and obnoxious. That's that's what people mean by American culture somehow for some reason, I guess, because, you know, we think we're so great and everyone else sucks. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't really have worldwide experience. I haven't gotten a lot of feedback that would suggest I'm such a person. Maybe I am. Maybe people are just being nice. But um, that's what I think. So you could do what you said and learn about other cultures and then try to approach it that way on their terms, on their playing field. Or you can just be sort of culturally neutral. And be like, well, look, here's a question. So as flavorless as possible, as culturally flavorless as possible, here's the answer. Here you go. So I think if you want to do what you're saying, that that's good. Um, you know, I prefer my kind of way of cultural neutrality because it doesn't it doesn't matter, right? Like we're all humans. So if someone says, you know, I'd like a glass of water, or which way is the restroom? Um, you know, you don't need you don't need a lot of cultural zing to just give them what they're asking for. Um, right. But if someone's like, which way is the banyo? And you're like, ha ha, you mean bathroom? You're so stupid. Um, you know, I guess that, that may be where we get it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, during my time in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, I got to fellowship with, Pakistan, with those who are Pakistani, uh, those who are ministers in the fellowship. Uh, one still lives, and he's one of our bishops in the uh, in the Life Ripples Ministries Global Faith Community. He's he's from Pakistan, but I've actually sat down and ate a meal, and I'm talking about Pakistani food, Pakistani and uh, Indian food are very similar. Uh, it's it's very spicy. <laughs> to say the least. But it's good after you get past the heat. After, after you get that that heat past your tongue and you just really taste the flavors of the meat, of the food, you you, you, uh, you learn. And they start teaching me a little bit of Urdu. I only know a little bit. But the one thing I notice is how they start their prayers. With the word with the word kadush, which means holy, and they and they start to pray out they, in their language. They say kadush, 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 holy, 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 and then you know then they go into the prayer. 
and they greet him as Holy Father. And then they they are they are not as animated in their in their uh, praise because you know me I come from the Black Baptist Church and we're very animated we're very energetic but when it came time for the praise one brother got on the kungas another brother got on the um, bongos and then I watched the women just get up and clap and all this I said oh okay (laughs) I know this but I had to get forward with other people's way of praising and worshiping God Um, I've been in I've been in uh what we will call Latin, Latin churches, and they're there, and the and the way of worship when they're praising and worshiping God is very similar to the black church, with a lot of uh, shouting and a lot of clapping, a lot of dancing, and of course you know, all that, that may is be, biblical. All that is yeah, biblical. <laughs> that, that that may be one of my one of my things where I I don't. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you want to do that, but that's that's not really me, though. So, you know, I'm not going to try to impose my ways on other people. But right. also, like, it's kind of like a game I don't really play, whether it's getting out of my comfort zone or or mm. just no. Um, so, yeah, I, I get what you're saying now. Like, you know, my wife is from another culture. So a lot of, you know, a lot of her family are like first generation uh, Americans. Mm. So um, they still have a lot of their a lot of their cultural stuff. Um, right. And. Uh, and whenever they do that, like, you know, they'll have different, like, greetings and different things like that. So, um, let's see. For example, like, they'll, they'll do this little bowing to your elders thing and stuff like that. So, uh, people mm. who are people who are my age, like my wife's family and her cousins, stuff like that, mm-hmm. there's, there's um, you know, one of her uncles is, is quite a bit older. They're, like, in their 70s. So, mm. uh, it's still a sign of respect. So, every time we get there, like, you know, my, my wife and her cousins and all of them, every time their uncle shows up, um, they'll do this little, like, bow bow like you know extend their hand like this little bow thing i guess like probably their version of like maybe a, a curtsy or something to someone like that but they do it for a family as like a sign of respect in their culture mm. but as long as i've known the guy you know i'm not gonna be like hey man give me a high five that's how we do it in america um <laughs> but on the other hand like you know it's it's not my culture i'm not their relative so you know i kind of forego that i'm just like handshake i'm like hello how are you good to see you again Right. So, you know, like it or not, that's that's kind of my operating area. And yeah. it turns out, you know, we're great friends. Like, I really like the guy a lot. Like, I've, I've known him for, uh, uh, you know, almost as long as I've known my wife. Um, right. So, um, that's and, and it, so it's, you know, we I usually spend more time hanging out with him uh, mm-hmm. than I do the other people at family gatherings and stuff. Because, you know, we just we just get along. He's easygoing. I mm-hmm. hope I'm easygoing. So, Chris, mm-hmm. how about you? If you show up in a in an African praise uh, circle, are you going to – or, or um, are you going to – you know, break out the bongos and um, do some dancing, Chris. Sure. Be very How about a shofar? If someone, if you if you you show up to a very Pentecostal church and someone hands you a shofar and a banner, are you gonna blow that thing and dance around with it? Probably not. <laughs> there's a there's a difference between being a cultural, you know, like um, idea and and people's actual cultures. And then people like creating culture from not having it. So I feel like if I went to Bethel Church and they, you know, had the worship dancers and the banners and the shofar and the glitter falling from the ceiling, I probably wouldn't be super enthused. But if I were in Sean's out, church, come, I come out, was, come out, Chris. What? Glitter falling from the ceiling? Whoa, 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 whoa. What's that question? <laughs> Did I just blow not, your mind, you Sean? Remember, I'm, I, I, I've got I got Pentecostal roots as well. So no, uh, well, yeah. What I was going to say is, if I were at your church, well, that has happened. yeah, but if I were at your church, Sean, I would I would be totally fine with everything you guys are doing. What, but with Bethel, like you know, that's a different kind of thing. No, and they they do they do like um, angel. Um, they do they say angels are here and they take chicken feathers and they blow them out the the air vents. And they drop um, glitter and talk about it being the the glow cloud of the Holy Spirit, and they um, they drop money one time. That was a thing. So yeah, they they use their air vents to great effect at their church. Oh wow! I feel like I just gave ten dollars and now I'm getting it back. 
praise God. No, but like, if I go to your church, Sean, I'm going to follow along with you guys because that's, you know, that's a genuine expression of, you know, who people are rather than a manufactured expression for some type of emotional manipulation. Sean, take this guy to your church. I want to see him dance. <laughs> Eagle, it would be if so he awkward. To a Holy Ghost buck, I'm going. I, you know, we gonna video it. Man. You going home? It's probably you're video. gonna be like, no, this this is something. Else. <laughs> well, welcome, Michael. Uh, Michael, you know, yesterday I saw, or the other day I saw on a Facebook thread, I, I got sucked into. Um, it was these people talking about you know thoughts and prayers, and it was it was um, these people who were. V- very not religious, um, you know, somewhere between atheist and, and Satanist, shout out, Jamesy. Um, there's like a, a satanic clothing line. So I, I guess it was on their thread. So uh, it was somewhere between atheists and Satanists and a couple of Christians just getting destroyed. But um, they're like, it's, it's the worst thing to say, you know, I'll pray for you. That really means I'm going to judge you and I'll pray for you. And that really means ah. I'm like, OK, I'm sure that's like, you know, a, a person in the South. You know, being like, bless your heart, looking down her nose through her glasses at you, you know, means anything other than bless your heart. I get it. There, there's some people who mean that. But you can't say that's most, uh, all, or, or even most, I think, people. Like, you know, if it's sincere meaning, if I say, oh, yeah, Michael, sure, I'll pray for you, buddy. Yeah, I'll pray for you. I'm probably meaning that sarcastically. Um, if I'm like, oh, my gosh, you're just in a terrible car wreck, blah, blah, I, I will pray for you, man. I'll keep you in my prayers. And, you know, I, I, so all these people, probably 50 comments are just like this kind of seething, frothing at the mouth, like rabid, whatever. And I, I was reminded by, by you, uh, you know, as an atheist, when you're like, well, when people tell me that, you know, I take it because it, I know what that means to them. So, you know, I'll just kind of, you know, take it on the chin, even though I don't agree with it. But I, I know that's a sign of respect coming from these people who do believe this. Uh, and I thought, you know, that, that makes me appreciate you, Michael. And I dared to say that, and I, I haven't even looked at the replies, but it probably wasn't nice. But I'm like, look, man, I've got atheist people who, you know, they, they lack a belief just like all of you. Um, but whenever people tell them, you know, they'll keep them in their prayers if something happens, they can accept that for what it is and uh, not, not get bent out of shape. They'll be like, okay, I know what that means to you, so thank you. Anyways. Well, yeah, and, and hey, morning, everybody. Yeah, I, I can typically tell, you know, I mean, <laughs> um, I'm a fairly I, – I can read people fairly well. And, and, and like you said, there's a lot, you know, the whole, you know, kind of bless your heart is a, you know, is a typically, you know, what's commonly, ex, you know, accepted as a, as a mild way of saying, you know, F you. Um, but uh, at, at least that's the, that's the way I've heard it, you know, kind of uh, intended many times. But yeah, when, when I, I try to take it, I, I try to take it basically on, on how I read it. So if I, if, if you were to say it, you know, as, as you said it, then, and I typically will respond with, well, you know, because I know what that means to you, thank you. Um, it doesn't, you know, I mean, yeah, it doesn't mean jack to me, right? Uh, but, but it, uh, you know, but taking it where it's coming from, you know, I will, uh, you know, I will appreciate it. But it, but a lot of it is, as you said, with, you know, tone of voice. Uh, if you're seeing the person, you know, if, if they're, if you're face to face with that individual, uh, you know, 80% of our communication is nonverbal. So you can tell a lot by sometimes their body language, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I think that, uh, I think that you do have to, um, you know, kind of take it as it's uh, as it's intended. I did find some of the other conversation you guys were having in, uh, interesting from the whole cultural thing. My brother-in-law is from uh, Senegal, and uh, and so they, you know, they, they have some the customs there. He's he's Muslim, and so you know they they have some customs and stuff that I'll I will I guess I will show a degree of respect for. But I will, there's that, you know, that old saying, you know, to, you know, to thy own self be true. And so I will not, uh, I will not partake of the culture um, in that I won't do any of the cultural things because I don't think that they are either efficacious or um, anything else. Or, or it's, there's a lot of people that say, oh, you know, you, you have to, you know, you have to respect my beliefs, which is bollocks. I don't have to respect your beliefs. I think I should respect you as an individual, but if you have what I, you know, think are, you know, bat crazy beliefs, I'm sorry, I'm not going to respect your beliefs because I think that they are, you know, insane. Um, but I will respect the individual. 
Um, Nate, you mentioned the whole, you know, kind of bowing thing. I have, you know, I, I have met people, uh, you know, from Japan, right? And that's the culture there, you know, they, they, they bow. And I have returned that because that from a cultural perspective, that's their handshake. And so I totally get that. Um, but I remember when my, when my mom was alive, she had a, a lot of respect for the royal family. And uh, there was one time when, when the, the royals came to Toronto and my mom wanted to go down. And I'm like, oh, okay, fine. And she's like, you're going to come. And I'm like, well, you need to understand that if, you know, if, if we get even within close proximity, I am, I will not bow to, to them. And she's like, well, no, you kind of have to. I'm like, well, I'm just, I'm not going to go. I said, because in that respect, like in like Royal, I think Royal, I think the monarchy is a farce and I will not bow to another human being out of respect to them if they're not going to do it out of respect to me. So they can just, you know, they can go jump off a cliff. Um, anyway, that's, that's uh, my two cents for this morning. And, you know, I think a lot of times, too, like, like the Japan and the bowing thing, uh, if, I mean, there is something like on your own term or on their own terms or whatever, I guess context, right? Like time and a place. But a lot of times, like, you know, people will think it's, um, gosh, I don't, I don't want to get political, but this, this example is just sticking out. Like we have had in America um, in years past several examples. Um, we have <laughs> um, an example of one leader going to Japan and absolutely like groveling, like head between toes, like way more of a deep bow than even their own people do. Um, and, and generally, um, I mean, you have to kind of read the reactions, but it seems like even even like the, you know, the leader of Japan thought that was a, a bridge too far um, versus we had another leader who kind of went and, and just did like a normal, you know, their culture. So it's like, you know, the Japan, the person from Japan did their cultural and, you know, their little formal bow. And the other person here was a president just did kind of a formal handshake, which, you know, both of them followed their own customs. So they both showed respect in their own way. And, you know, being adults, they both understood that, that that was their cultural way of respect. And it seemed to be a much better uh, beneficial meeting uh, than, than the other guy that tried to go above and beyond to appease and, and seemed to just kind of make a fool of themselves. Um, gosh, I hope you can read between the lines. Um, but that, that's just like the greatest, the greatest example of what this conversation is talking about. It's like sometimes like just going above and beyond and trying to like, you know, because I mean, that, that can be a, a offensive on a certain level. Would you, would you agree? Like if, if someone has a certain culture, like the guy from wh wherever you said Singal, if you tried to like go overboard uh, to like extravagantly show how, how like culturally in sync you are and how you're trying to like, um, at a certain point, it's just kind of pandering, right? And you're like, oh my God, dude, like this is my culture and you're overboard. Just, just stop it. Stop it. Am I making my case? Do you see what I'm saying? Like there, there could be definitely going too far the other direction. All right, I killed the topic. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. <laughs> no, you didn't. Here's, here's, the, here's the bottom line. You, you can go too far. Uh, I know that there's certain things that are delicacies that I know I just cannot eat. All right? Uh, I'm not going to eat dog. And there are parts of Korea that eat dog. I can't do it. <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, in the Pakistani culture, uh, one day they made some made some they barbecued some chicken, but they barbecued it with the spices, with that extra. They put, I, I think they put, I, they put extra cayenne pepper <laughs> <laughs> on the meat. It was a little too spicy for me. I, but I did not just spit it out my mouth. When I bit it, I swallowed the portion that I that I bit into, and then I explained to the cook. I said, "Thank you, but it's a little too spicy for me." There is always a decorum you can use. And they respected that I that I did at least try the food. Um, so I think decorum as well as uh, handling, your, handling yourself in a classy manner. Because people I know from all cultures were classy. They know decorum. Yeah, I mean, it's more body language. Just kind of, re like Michael said, like reading people than how you... Yeah, than necessarily what you're doing or if you're bowing or how much you're bowing. And Chris, mm -hmm. where do you stand on uh, Cashew Kitty? Is 
Is it okay to make culturally appropriated jokes? I don't know. Hey, Saint, what's up? Hey, good morning. Uh, do you guys know, is there... So, a lot of people are, like, started studying Greek and Hebrew, and I've been listening to a lot of, like, Trinitarian debates. And it, it seems that a lot of the translations aren't correct or aren't, like, spot on. Is there any movement or anybody, like, trying to make a Bible that's more correct? A lot of scriptures, so, like, another scripture, like, take, take all thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. If you look at all the different translations it it really changes the scripture a lot on what it on the message that it's trying to relay if you know what i mean well i mean unless you're fluent in greek and hebrew and there are may because anyone trying to do that just saying uh, well i mean you're never going to have your a perfect translation the best you have is you know unless you're uh, fluent in hebrew greek and aramaic then you're going to have to use some other translation that is your language. Um, so, I mean, they're not bad, right? Like even King James, like people bag on King James and they'll say, well, you know, it's, it's older and we found more manuscripts since then and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it still does a really good job. Like, it's not like it's a terrible piece of work. Like it's amazingly good, almost as if, uh, you know, a deity had a hand in its creation because of all the stuff, you know, all the stuff people have found since, it just confirms most of what the King James already already got right without it. So um, it, it's not like they're bad. But uh, yeah, I mean, if someone wants to know, like, you know, we have one word for love in English. It's love. Um, there's five in Greek. So it doesn't mean the translations are terrible. It just means you have to have the presence of mind to know what's what. So when it's talking about, you know, God's love for, for creation and the world, well, what kind of love is that? Is that love like a romantic love, like a husband and a wife? Of course not. Um, how do you, Then how do you know what type of love it is? Well, you can take a lot of Greek classes, or you can just go to blueletterbible.org and use Strong's Concordance, and it'll tell you what kind of love it is. So it's it's not difficult. So instead of trying to join a movement to you know, become, uh, become a Hebrew or a Greek scholar, just get a Strong's Concordance, and it'll tell you exactly what the word means and what the original means and what, why it was translated the way it was. So when, you know, when we're told like, you know, at, uh, like romantic love between husbands and wives, that would be like euros. Or Euros or whatever, and Euro, Euros, something like that. It's like romantic Eros. type love. Eros. Yeah, that. And, and then if we're talking about like you know like agapo or agape, that's like this parental, like all-encompassing uh, type love. If we're talking about like philo or philo, that's like this brotherly love, like you know like Pennsylvania, like uh, Philadelphia, what it was named for, which is anything but. If if you've seen the streets lately, but just saying. So I mean, yeah, it doesn't mean the Bible's wrong. It doesn't mean it's a bad translation. It just means either know the context. So if it's talking about a deity loving the world, do we think that's like a brotherly love? Like a, hey, bro, I love you a lot. Or like a, a father of creation type love for the for the world. So if you can't figure that out on your own, go grab a concordance and it'll tell you. It'll tell you exactly what I said. I've looked it up plenty. That's why I know that. It's it's agapo or agape. Does that answer your question, Saint? Yeah, no, I'm not, I wasn't like bad in the Bible. It just... When I, when I do a cross-reference on what scriptures say, a lot of them are different, and then a lot of them say a totally different thing. It would just be nice if, if scholars could get together and be like, this is exactly what it says, like especially in 2022 when uh, we've learned more and... Uh, it would just be. See, see nice what are you talking a... about? Like, I don't understand. I, I, don't understand I, I, th I think he made. Well, I want Chris because there was actually a Bible that you know Chris's <laughs> uh, just came out with. It was you know whatever the one they did during COVID. But I, I think he maybe talked about like the the literal word for word translation versus the spirit. And in that case, like you know, it, it doesn't matter. Like it, it's, it helps you read. So if you want a literal, like the most literal is going to be like the New American Standard Bible. And that may be a little harder to read because it's trying to get the exact word and it's it's sacrificing the message. So if the, the word for word, like metal, door, bolt, gate, wood, 
you may be thinking, what the heck are these words? I mean, it's not that bad. You can still read it. But it, it's a word for word, like literal translation versus if you get like uh, the New Living Translation, it may not say all, all the words. It may just have the message, which is like, you know, come come to the pasture that Jesus is waiting in um, that just to make it easier on your ears to understand and comprehend. It's more of a message, uh, the spirit of it than the literalness. So you're going to have I mean, it's options. I mean, sometimes less is more, but in this case, more is more. It's just what helps you understand. But yeah, go ahead, Chris. And talk also about that Bible that whoever it was just came out with the new, the new translation that's supposed to be literal. You know what I'm talking about, Chris? You're talking about the LSB. Yeah. But but go ahead with your original. SV thought. is great. Like it's not, it's not like there's translations. When people go to the Greek. Um, it's usually to bring out enhances the text, not changes the meaning of the text. Uh, Saint? Is that helpful? Uh, not at all? Michael, when you read the Bible, um, were you very confused by a lot of it, or did you did you just kind of have did you just kind of um, if you didn't understand something, be like, okay, I got it good enough, or did you need to go look up specific words that you put that much uh, that much effort into it, or just kind of read it and took it at face value? I didn't start doing that kind of stuff until I was already an atheist. Um, when, when I read the Bible, I just kind of read it, and if I had questions, I'd go in and you know ask someone you know someone who I viewed as a person of authority or greater knowledge than me. Um, and uh, try to get, you know, a deeper understanding from them. Um, I started out, I guess, when I was a kid with the KJV, because that's what uh, more of my parents used. Uh, and then I just went to an NIV because it was just uh, easier to understand, if that makes sense. Um, but, I mean, <laughs> it's funny that you say when I read the Bible, because I, I still read it. Oh, what do you read now? What's your go-to translation? Um. I bounce around between uh, uh, NASB and NIV. How often do you read it? Um, I have an audiobook version on my phone that I listen to portions every day. Is it is it usually just to kind of um, brush up on the most recent Bible conversation you're in, or do you Sometimes. just like start from the beginning and just go all the way through, or is it mostly around stuff you find problematic, or like how, how often I guess do you find yourself in the Gospels or the New the New Testament? Um, I want to say as often as I find myself in any, any other portion of it. Um, and it's, you know, when, you, when you're asking, you know, kind of which portions of this, you know, kind of this or that, it's, you know, kind of a little column A and a little column B. Um, I'm kind of all over the place with it. Um, and it's very much, uh, like you said, you know, oh, you know, we were having a discussion about X, so I'm going to look up, you know, X, or we have a discussion about Y, uh, so on and so forth. So it all depends kind of who I was talking to and what we were talking about. Um, that kind of dictates the flow of where the, uh, of where my focus goes. So quick. So like the CEV in second Corinthians 10, five, it says, uh, in every bit of pride that keeps anyone from knowing God, we capture people's thoughts, and make them obey Christ. So that's 10, 5, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 in the CEV. In the ESV, it says, we destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Uh, the ASV says, casting down imaginations, every high thing that is exalted against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought in true captivity to the obedience of Christ. So, so when I'm trying to study, I'm getting like every translation changes a little bit. Like the CEV takes brings the taking thoughts captive and puts it totally on the other person, not ourselves. So we capture people's thoughts and make them obey Christ. So do you see when I'm trying to like what translation is correct through 
all these five who I just studied. It would just be nice if there was a more solid one, a more go-to one, you know. Does yeah, that explain you're more confusing of... yourself. Use the ESV or the LSB. Those are the most modern, accurate translations. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. I would, I would agree. That's what the ESV it says. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. <clears throat> so is there is so the ESV? What would you guys? That's a good question. I guess that you guys think the ESV is the best. That's the one I use the most. It uses I use the, the most NLP modern scholarship, different. and it uses the you know it's it's a really good translation. It tries to be as unbiased as possible. It's funny. Yesterday, we're actually uh, looking. Oh, sorry. No, I just use the NLT because it's the easiest for me to read, but I know it's not the best. Well, there's biases in that. Right? In what? In what one? New Living Translation. Oh, okay. What do you think the biases uh, lean lean towards? That's I, I read that a long time ago, but um, it's been a while since I. I read you it. can look them up for any particular translation. So you just look and see who the actual translators are, who are on the translation board, and then you go and you look at their part of it. That will tell you their bias. They're going to cut out every verse that has to do with Calvinism. They're going to make it. <laughs> oh, so you're saying I mean, we should go back to reading it. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just saying, like, you know, translations can have biases. The, they're going to have the least amount of bias and be the most literal that they can be, which is what the LSV tries to do, as well as, um, you know, the ESV. Um, you know, so you're, you're going to, and you're going to have people that still like KJV and for reasons and whatever, but honestly, like you're, you're, you're really going to need to do a little bit of research to see what the biases of the translators are, you know, like for instance, the NIV, um, one of the guys who did a lot of the major translation work for the NIV is a, um, is a, uh, Egal was an egalitarian, just passed away. He was an egalitarian. He believed that women pastors are cool. If you look at the NIV and compare it to the text, to the Greek text, you're going to see a lot of very subtle changes that seem to support women pastors. But, uh, you know, stuff like that. Hmm. It's funny, like I was saying, I started uh, actually picked up an NASB for the first time actually after listening to Matt Slick talk about how much he liked that translation um and, and it's interesting i take a slightly different slant on it because when i read it i'm not so much looking for biases i'm just looking at what the book actually says so i think you know chris it might be fair to say that you look at it with a well i don't think it might be fair to say it's i think it's positively the truth that you look at it with a different slant and i think that's probably true of many people in different denominations right they look at these things with their particular slant. I don't mean slant in a disrespectful way, but they look at it with their with their thoughts in mind. And so you, it, I don't think it would be surprising that someone would lean more towards a translation that is more supportive. And I'm not necessarily saying that's what you're doing, but it wouldn't surprise me that someone read a translation that was more supportive of the things that they are more believed to be more true. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I mean... And, and the thing is, is, like, we can always look up the original. Like, that's the thing is that, <laughs> you know, in generations past, like, Greek books were very expensive because the typesetting was insanely expensive. And so you only saw, you know, Greek translations and, and the, you know, the stuff that we use to, to translate now um, in pastor's libraries or in university libraries because the typesetting was insanely expensive. Nowadays, like, I mean, you can go on the internet to Blue Letter Bible, and you can li literally look at, you know, the the Greek underneath the the translation, and decide for yourself: is this accurate or not? Like, it's pretty easy. You know, there's a lot of information out there. You know, that's why people like the ESV 
is because the ESV was translated in view of everybody's going to be able to look at the Greek. You're not going to get one over on anybody, <laughs> which some of the earlier translations were trying to get one over on people. Yeah, I mean, I like it because it's, I mean, you know, if you look at the little Bible timeline or type scale where it talks about literal versus word for word, I mean, it's like, the, I, I think it's like second, second most literal, like word for word translation. And um, it's also still really easy to read uh, as far as the way it flows and stuff. So I like it. Yeah, and that's why a lot of people switch to it, right? You're like, I like the LSB because it's, it's now the most literal. Right, so the LS, all the LSB is is a uh, reworking of some of the NSAB and the uh, New American Standard Bible um, 95, and so the LSB is just an updated version where they basically the big change is that where it says Yahweh, they put in Yahweh, like in the Old Testament. So if it says Why? Elohim, they put Elohim. If it says Yahweh, they put Yahweh. Do you Instead know why they reworked the? Yeah, do you? Yeah, because that capital word really throws people for a loop. <laughs> do you know why they reworked the ninety-five and not the most current NASB? Because the most current NASB got was gotten hold of by theological liberals who changed a bunch of the text to fit their biases. Ah. So how did I? Ha I've only read parts of it. it by the way, is it whenever I? I, I think. Um, Bacon has told me about it. Like there was only the New Testament available at the time online. Is the whole LSB available now? And is it? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so is it open? Is it U version? Yeah, U version just got it. There's not a. The problem with the LSB right now is there's not an audio Bible, so I still go to the ESV because I like to when I'm driving long distance or something. Then I like to play the audio Bible. Um, but there's no audio Bible for the LSB yet. Like it just hasn't been recorded. So is, is it copywritten or is it like open for everyone? No, it's open for everyone. Um, you know who owns that? I mean, like, I mean, like, uh, legally open, like not copyrighted, like, you know, the other translations have like copyrights and stuff like that. Oh, I, I would have no idea. I, I mean, with like, that's one Bible thing translation, I translation, unless you're actually just printing the entire thing, no one's going to come after you for copying and pasting it. I was just curious. I mean, I know like the World English Bible, like it's like legitimately, like I, I haven't looked uh, about, you know, I, I only use it when I'm citing something, like citing something I'm, I'm taking large portions out. Um, so I don't, I don't really know about the tran the translation, how great it is, because I haven't really read it other than when I need something that's completely free and open to use. Um, but I do appreciate th at least that much about it, um, that it's completely, there's no copyright that's open, like if someone wants to publish the entire Bible under their own, um, they can do that. So I, I didn't know. I know most of them have some sort of copyright on them. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure it does. I, you know, it's standard publishing. You know who owns the LSB? Who? John MacArthur. <laughs> Not really one of my favorite people. <laughs> Why is that, Sean? Because he, because his session is views, and he lumped every charismatic and Pentecostal into the one in one boat. And when you broad brush like that, mm -mm. you're right. Mm -mm. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, I mean, he he threw the word faith people in with the Pentecostals, and that kind of irritated. No, you can't do that. Um, so yeah, he's not not right about that for sure. But you know, in terms of being a solid Bible teacher, oh uh, uh, yeah, he's a solid Bible teacher, but he got he he never repented of that. I just don't think he understands the nuance. I, you know, like, I think that, you know, and you got to understand he's in Southern California where they got invaded by the Jesus movement and they saw all manner of nonsense. And so I think he is lumping them all together because that was his personal experience. Because basically, like, you know, a bunch of those people were so far off and so apostate and had never been taught that they just <laughs> evolved into such nonsense um, you know, and then you've got Chuck Smith and some of his um, infamous behavior. You know, and, and some of I, I don't know too much things. about Chuck Smith. I know, yeah. I know, but I, but I do know that Blue Letter Bible comes from him. 
Yeah, I'm not saying Chuck Smith is a bad guy. He just did a lot of bad stuff back in the 80s and 90s. Oh, I can't hold his, I can't hold his past against him. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, uh, you know, I'm just saying, like, uh, you know, there's, there's history. Let's just say that in Southern California, there's some history there between, you know, there were some solid Bible-believing churches, you mm-hmm. know, and then and then all this, this manner of stuff happened, and, you know, and then you got third wave charismaticism, you know, and, and you know as well as I do, because you know a lot about church history, like third wave charismaticism was like, if you talk to other Pentecostals, they're like, oh yeah, third wave is terrible. Because, mm-hmm. because it did mix so much with prosperity gospel that, mm-hmm. you know, that became very problematic. But then to, but you're totally right also that to paint all charismatics with the third wave is unfair. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, because I, at one time, I was part of the word faith movement, but I got up out of there uh, after three years. <laughs> uh, and, and that was very early in my walk with the, with the Lord. But I do understand uh, that you, you've got, because they taught me a lot of truth as well. And well, I got like I, I spit out the meat and chewed I spit out the bone and chewed the meat. But uh what I will say historically, and I'm looking at and I, I'm looking at this book uh by Eddie Lee Hyatt, uh Eddie L. Hyatt Hyatt, I should say. It's called Two Thousand Years of Charismatic Christianity and I, I looked at it. I looked at some things about what Tertullian origin and and them had to say, and 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 then I'm looking at some of the things he puts in that's obvious that as obvious it was heretical, like the monastic movement, uh, monetist movement, the, the, the monetist movement. Uh, I hope I'm saying that right. Of the uh, of the early three uh, hundreds, if I'm not mistaken, two hundreds, three hundreds. Yeah, it was a two two seventy five to like three ten. Yeah, and when I'm looking at that, I said, "Well, you wrong for for including them in it, because they were obviously they did do Christian. They they stuck we had one thing they focused on prophecy and vision more than they did on the full word of God, and and that's where they that's what they made a major mistake." Uh, I'm looking at uh, also. I look at folks, and MacArthur was right because I was reading. Um, I actually own Dr. Michael Brown's uh, book, uh, Authentic Fire, and where he says that um, MacArthur was uh, actually correct in his making the charismatic Pentecostal churches look at themselves and see. What was not biblical, not like that. Now, I, I was going to get what you talked about Bethel Church earlier, and that should be out. Uh, when you when you have to use theatrics, uh, such as I, I don't mind the waving of banners, and I sure don't mind a good praise dance. But I, but when you got to use the theatrics of blowing feathers out and having glitter fall from the ceiling, no, no, that that now you're bringing theatrics into it. Now I know there's a place for arts and entertainment in in the body of Christ, but that's for those who are trained actors and and other things. But to do uh, singers and what have you. But I do not agree with using theatrics to say that the Lord is doing. The Lord is blowing, bringing the glitter, bringing glory down from heaven, and feathers coming out of the angels are, are are present like that. No. That that's not that's not by that's not by. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, let me be real clear. Like, I have a lot of charismatic brothers and sisters, like yourself, that I would sit under you in your church. You know, like it's not gonna. You know, these are these are secondary issues. Um, you know, do I have a problem with word faith people, and do I have a problem with you know false testimonies and? you know, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. You know, am I going to throw everybody out? No. I mean, now Michael Brown has his own problems, right? So Michael Brown 
affirms people like Kenneth Copeland as brothers, and he affirms word faith people as brothers, which gives weight to MacArthur's arguments. That's kind of a problem, right? Is that he does not reject people like Todd White. And he does not reject people like Todd. Well, he, he finally, when he was backed into a corner with a mountain of evidence against Todd Bentley, he finally was like, okay, Todd Bentley's maybe not good. But, you know, he still promotes Kat Kerr and says that she's a wonderful sister in Christ. So Michael Brown has some Kat serious, Kerr, I don't know serious problems. Is. Oh, Ask our resident atheist who Kat Kerr is. Michael would love to tell you all about her. Michael, uh, yeah, Michael, you you, you wanted to uh, maybe uh, give me some information about her. About, give me a quick, uh, just give me some quick points about who she is, and I'll do some research because I have a class that I have to teach in like 20 minutes. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, well, this will only take a second. So uh, just uh, you could just you can look her up on YouTube, find her kind of greatest hits. So Kat Kerr is someone who believes that she she actually, you know, had the power to stand on a beach and, you know, look at the the, hur- the incoming hurricane and command it away in the name of God. She also has been she also has videos out there where she has stated that she has been at parties in heaven with Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston. That she she goes to heaven on a regular basis and comes back. And she talks to people there all the time and gets all kinds of inside stuff. And yeah, she's um, she's a complete psychopath. I will do some research um, because I got to prepare for class. And I thank you. Thank you. Um, spell her name. Give me the spelling of her name. Uh, K-A-T-T-K-E-R-R. K-A-T-T-K-E-R-R. That is correct. That sounds like somebody who is highly involved in uh, outer body Revealing experiences. Revealing heaven, heaven eyewitness. I see a book that's popped up by her. So, okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go from there. Thank you. What, Todd? Sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. I must be very low. We I hear was you. Saying, I was saying that that sounds like a person who has tried uh, occultic kind of stuff way too many times, like trying to uh, provoke out of body experiences. And, uh, maybe she's got too many, uh, demonic forces on her and she's like going, she thinks she's going to heaven. (laughs) She's dreaming with demons or something crazy. Seriously. Cause that sounds ridiculous. Goes to heaven on a regular basis. Yeah. You lie in bed with your mouth open with, you know, and you just try to think you're going to heaven, but you're actually uh, being possessed, probably, crazy woman. <laughs> um, Michael didn't even Michael didn't even mention like any of. The, let's put it this way: the stuff that Michael just mentioned is the most sane stuff that she believes. What's the most insane stuff she believes? And is there like a, a greatest hits clip? Is there just like a oh yeah, you can video? she's on oh dude, there's hours of her like hours. This is why it's so easy to mine this. Um, there's there's the whole clips of her talking about um, seventy foot sasquatches in heaven, um, and in great detail. Uh, what was the other one? Oh, um, uh, aborted children that ride ponies and unicorns well, well, in a okay, special I, wait, field. Wait, I gotta ask a question. Yeah. Is basically she the Doctor Strange of charismatic Christianity? Yes, she is Doctor Strange. Yes, she is the fe- <laughs> but she also has pink hair, Sean. Pink which hair. is pretty sweet. Yeah, the dye has soaked into her skull. Yeah, she's got she's the pink. she's got the she's pink. Yeah. But okay. this is Dr. Uh, Brown. This is Dr. Michael Brown's so best buddy. Parts, <laughs> Michael Brown has her on his show all the time. I've never seen her on the show. So I, and I, so it, she must have been a recent guest. No, no, no. Been She's this. been on there for years. You can find hundreds of clips of her on Michael Brown. You can get, and like, you can, if you Here's call Michael it. Brown's show mm-hmm. and you ask him about Kat Kerr, he will throw you off the show. Oh. <laughs> Because yeah. he is, he knows he's embarrassed, and he knows she's a whack job, but yet he continues to platform her. 
Ooh, we, yeah. Well, if I want to watch Doctor Strange, I'll read. I'll watch the movie. <laughs> oh, I, I watched Spider-Man. But, yeah, Spider-Man. Uh, but, but uh, as far as 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 far as uh, somebody trying, you talked about uh, going to that to that realm. I know a little bit about it. Uh, that <laughs> on the astral plane, that's what it's real. That's that, that's the proper name for it. That's straight up occult. That's witchcraft, like like a bad boy. And the Bible says he, the Bible says you, he don't suffer a wish to live. So I, no, I don't do. I can't. I, like uh, dear Hall and John O said back in the in the eighties, I can't go for that. No can do. <laughs> All right, uh, that's good old DJ and me coming out. So, but uh, I'm gonna go to class. And if we are, if y'all still going, or if y'all back here on little after, late afternoon, I'll come and talk to you. Hey, I'd also love you to talk to my son about Taekwondo when you get a few minutes, too. He's a second-degree black belt in Taekwondo. He's working on that's his a, third. That's a bad boy you got right <laughs> if, if he got, if, we, if he's a, he, he, if he already get a second degree in Taekwondo, that's that Korean martial art. Ooh-wee. Give your, uh, give your class a tough pop quiz, quiz for us on behalf of the Ask a Christian Room. All right. <laughs> I'll do that. I'll do that. In fact, Wednesday, we're going to do Wednesday, I would love your input because uh, y'all, y'all have the links. Wednesday, uh, I would love you and Chris input in the class when we deal with some things on church history and discipleship formation. Uh, so uh, it's going to, I think it'll be a blessing for you to come up. Y'all to come up, and I want y'all in the Zoom. I want y'all. I want. I love y'all input. I really appreciate it. Um, for those who are the link, Chris, those who don't, I get get the link for either Chris or Nate. Come on in Wednesday, and I and if you're not here on here later on, I'll see y'all tomorrow morning. Yeah, send me a link, Pastor. You already had the link, Nate. Uh, yeah, I think I got it in. Um, yeah, my back chat. Yeah, I'll share okay. it to you, Chris. <laughs> Uh, Chris right, got it. Too. I sent it to Chris. I sent it. I know I sent it to Chris. Oh, okay. Right. When did, did was it a while ago? It was last week. Oh, <laughs> it was last asked. week. Okay, I get a lot of back channel faster. So <laughs> oh, really okay. Well, I did. I'll resend it. I'll resend it. Well, right. Chris, uh, in in chat, apparently you can make two hundred to thirty four hundred dollars in three days of trading. Pretty sweet. You know, I I took um, eighteen thousand dollars and turned it into six thousand with crypto. <laughs> but I'm holding, so hopefully it'll come back up. Is it Dogecoin? I do own a little bit of Dogecoin, not much. How do you? Make... Did you get it? Did you get it when it was good or when it got expensive? No, I actually made profit on Dogecoin, so I got it. When, I bought it when it was really low at like nine cents, and then I sold it at like seventy-four or something like that. I don't... How do you make up, ten? Matt? dollars in the airline business how mac start with a hundred million (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, uh. how's your monday going mac uh kind of frantic dude i just bought a phone for a client on amazon and it was sold as new and I opened the package and it's clearly used. <laughs> I am unhappy. Does prime returns uh, also take one to two days? I just, I have to deploy this phone today. I have no choice because they're opening tomorrow. It's a restaurant and they have to have a phone. So I'm going to do it, but I'm going to, I'm going to process the return and just buy another one. And, yeah. So wh- why do you have to buy them a phone? Just because it's like your job to just like make everything work? Yeah, they waited until the last minute. They didn't know what to order. And I was like, you know what? Fine, I got this. I'm just going to deal, deal with it. And I'll bring the phone and install it. Because I gave them three weeks to buy the phones. I sent them the Amazon links. And then they're like, where are our phones? And I'm like, the, what? what? <laughs> Stop. Lou, what do you know that we don't? World War Three. Who's doing what now? 
what is what is some genius said that's gonna get us into World War Three? Besides, you know, just the the regular stuff. So I mean, this is this is like got to be like a complicated phone, right? That like hooks up to computers or internet or internet or stuff, like not just like a phone you could buy at Walmart, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a IP phone. It's got to get hooked up to the. They have the most complicated PBX that I manage. All right, Mac. Got any questions for us today? Otherwise, we're going to talk tech. Uh, no thanks. So tech or questions? Oh, I got a question. Um, so how come the Amish can use um can use forklifts as long as they're hydraulically powered? I didn't know they could or did, and I have no idea why. Because the idea is that the technology alienates you from God, right? Uh, but they're willing to use the forklift in pretty much its, you know, modern form, but they're not willing to, like, you know, turn on an electric motor. So it's hydraulic, simply, like, mechanically hydraulically powered. Let's see if Chatbot knows the answer to this. Oh, and Michael, the Canadian atheist, uh, do you agree with me that the Mennonites in Ontario um, abuse our religious freedom laws in order to make their kids drop out of school at 14? Actually, it's a good question for you, socio like social worker. No, no. It, yeah, so it, um, I, I am not a fan of religious exemptions in any way, shape, or form, especially when they uh, endanger children. So, like, there's a reason. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think homeschooling is a good thing. Um, like, there, there's a, there are these buildings all over the, all over the world, right? And we put teachers in them, and that's where we send kids to because that's where the teachers are. Um, and unless you are a teacher, uh, because there's more to, there's more to teaching than just. Um, this, I, I've done a little bit of this as well. Um, there's more to teaching than just knowing the curriculum. Yeah, I know. Um, I, I'm a certified teacher, Michael. I, I'm well aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there's, so there's, there, there's a lot to, there's a lot to teaching, right? There's, there's a, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot to it. And so, I think that any form of religious exemption, especially, like I said, especially when it endangers children, and I think not providing children with an education, like I, I don't care what kind of school you go to, like I don't care if you go to a faith-based school, right? I want an educated populace, and so. I, I think schools are important. And so, yes, I think that uh, denying people uh, an education uh, should be. But they use the farm. I think it should almost be. Yeah, I think it should almost be. Yeah, I think it should almost be criminal. Yeah, I, I, I think disagree. They with can't completely. because they use the farm laws. Right. Yeah, no, I, I understand. They're the only and ones I, I who use bogus. the farm laws. Yeah, it's bogus. Yeah. It's garbage. It shouldn't be the case. Uh, can we're, you we're, give me we're, a... we're not going to disagree on that. Michael, can you tell me what you're talking about in 30 seconds? I was looking for the Amish question, and I have an answer. But can you uh, – I'm curious. The Mennonite thing, uh, abusing laws, uh, can you recap that in 30 seconds? Oh, so – well, so basically – well, it's actually Max, Max thing. But, yeah, basically what uh, – we, we have um, – we, we do have religious protection laws in Canada. And what uh, the, the Mennonites in Ontario uh, have done is they've used that to their advantage, but they, but they, they guise it under the, the, under the, the farming community. That, that they run, and they use that as a way to uh, extract their children from public school and and deny them what I see are the fundamental basics of, of education. I have a coworker, uh, Michael, who um, whose wife is Mennonite, and he's adamant that the Mennonites don't want to to you know get an education, and therefore, who are we to force them to? Okay, and so the problem isn't homeschooling. The problem is basically they don't want them in any school, and they're using right. it, saying it's homeschool, while they're really just like go they play in the field or school. work or something. They don't say it's homeschool. Yeah, and it's, okay. and it's, it's more but, insidious than that because um, uh, girls are even are educated to an even lower standard because uh, all women need to be able to do is spread their legs. I don't know if that's true because, because uh, see, when I was in teacher's college um, – uh, uh, see, at Teachers College, cultural diversity, unless it's like white Christian diversity, 
is considered like or is considered really awesome, right? And these and I was like a dyed in the wool like social justice warrior liberal, but I was more like a so Sam Harris type of liberal, right? So so when I uh, there were a couple of uh, teacher candidates who worked in Mennonite communities. And they they took all these photos and the, and it was depicted as quaint and you know old timey and isn't that cool and isn't that diverse and all but like I saw it as insidious you know they take their kids out of school you know so they can be ignorant and you know live in their tiny towns you know and and um, you know and flouting our laws um, and so can I found it to be insidious. Can someone try to steal man? Is it like would it would like would it, the most charitable way be like because they don't man, want they, they don't want well, to get my question out? Yeah. Would it be something like because they don't want the world to like corrupt their people with their ideas or something that's, like that? That's half of it, and the other half is we need them to work on the farms. Yeah, yeah, and, okay. and breed. So and breed. Ah. Uh, well, anyway, my my point, Michael, was that they 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 took both boys and girls out of the school. Like almost oh, yeah, no. like on their fourteenth birthday they were gone. Yeah. yeah and, they, and they portrayed it as quaint at my teacher's college, at my super liberal teacher's college. They they at University of Toronto. They you know, which is supposedly the elite school in Ontario for teaching. You know, they depicted this as quaint and culturally diverse. Oh yeah, I think, so, there's, some pacif so I, I think there's some pacification going on there. I do have an answer for the Amish. Oh, awesome. Uh, Felix, Felix was kind of right. So the Amish are a religious group who value simplicity and separation from the modern world. The use of electricity is generally considered too modern and is a symbol of pride, which is against the Amish way of life. Forklifts, on the other hand, are seen as a tool for work, much like horses and buggies, and are not seen against going against their values. Um, however, each Amish community has its own set of guidelines known as Ordnug which dictate what technology and practices are acceptable. The use of forklifts may be okay in some communities, but not allowed in others. Uh, but generally, they are seen as acceptable tools for work. Uh, Good job, chatbot. Sure. I'll be back, but, guys. i got to go for a second. But the they're willing to use all the parts of the forklift that were created using electricity it's not like the forklift was was you know made with you know they forged the metal and they they you know they were willing to let Shabos Goyim uh, uh, build the forklift you know and and they were willing to let unbelievers build the forklift and then they're willing to use it like I think it's hypocritical. Well, but what's the reason? I mean, you talked about unbelievers. That I mean, from what you know, from what Chatbot says. That doesn't seem to be their issue against using technology. It seems to be uh, viewed as a, as a sort of pride. So it, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with the religious bent of the people making this stuff. It has to do with is it pride for or not. And I guess if you're using tools for, for work, um, that's that would be a distinguishing factor rather than the religious bent of someone of who made the tools. Yeah, but there's tons of prideful work that went into building the forklift in the first place. Well, go ask them. I don't know. Well, I asked you. <laughs> I'm not Amish. <laughs> well, I think I think you tried your best. I think Chatbot did a pre pretty respectable job. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess that's the answer, right? So, like, if you go and, and they're like, well, we don't see it as a symbol of pride. And you're like, but look at all the prideful people. And they're like, I don't know what to tell you. This is what, uh, you know, our, our community has decided on. This is the answer. But, so I guess just, you can tell them they're wrong. Just because is a silly answer. Well, it's not just because. I mean, I'm sure, again, not being Amish and researching this for 30 seconds, they will probably have a better explanation. But you can't call them on the phone. You're going to go need to, you know, <laughs> find their community and ask them. But I mean, I think it, I mean, I think it makes sense. Like, I'm sure. Oh, well, I mean, I'm sure they have. Um, I mean, I'm sure they put the they, phones yeah. in a central location. Oh, uh, interesting. They need them. Yeah, they're, it's, they're very inconsistent. Okay. Well, I mean, you, I, I guess we can't. I guess we can't generalize all of them because I'm sure there are people that use no fort Amish that use no fort cliffs or phones or any of it. I think you would say, well, they're very consistent. So yeah, apparently, yeah. each community has different guidelines. Well, even then, I'd be like, why is technology from the 17th century okay, but not from the 18th century when there still wasn't electricity? 
and then they would either tell you they have an answer um, or they'd tell you to leave. <laughs> I think they'd get over it. <laughs> what do you think, Todd? Do you have any expertise on Amish and forklifts? <laughs> I do not have any expertise on the Amish. Uh, I would agree in a sense that the Amish are a little inconsistent, and I am a Christian. <laughs> so, Aren't the Amish Christians, in your view? Uh, they think so. They profess to be, but um, they're so inconsistent that they may not even be considered truly in the faith. The Mennonites well, in Canada are Calvinist, like they're proper Calvinist. Yeah, they're definitely going to be. They're definitely going to be. Um, what's the word for that? Like a John Jonathan Edwards, you know, makes sense. But uh, well, what do you mean inconsistent? Because we couldn't rule someone out of the faith for their inconsistent views on electricity. So I mean, yeah. in, well, they're inconsistent in scripture or. What? In general, in general, when they say, "Oh, we can't do this," "Oh, we can't do that," "Oh, we can't do this," now you're getting into legalism, and so they think that by what they are doing, they are keeping themselves saved. Maybe I don't. Maybe, maybe they don't believe that, but they, you know, look at their fruits, look at their behavior, look at how they live. If they are just doing not doing all of these things because they think it gives them good grace with God, then. Uh, I don't think that their faith is in grace by faith. So, you know, you got to live what you believe. I have no idea. Yeah, I know. Like, aren't they, they were founded as like Anabaptist, right? I don't know if they <coughs> still are or if they, that was just kind of their founding. Um, I don't know either. Uh, I would say maybe. And I do know that the Anabaptists do have some beliefs that, you know, aren't, very orthodox. They kind of they kind of fall from it. So, yeah. Anytime I see somebody that gets very legalistic and thinks that you cannot live a certain way, in that sense, none of those things they do is immoral. You, you, you know, it's not immoral to use technology. I think God gives us technology to better our lives, and I think God uses technologies for His own glory. Um, so, no. The things that are immoral, we shouldn't be doing because they are called immoral in the Bible. But, you know, using a cell phone certainly is not. Todd, someone's asking in chat which eschatology is more correct. Uh, well, mine, of course. <laughs> hey, yeah. I don't know. Eschatology. Uh, worst subject to talk about. Todd, what do you mean? Yeah, I mean, God, you I, I mean... <clears throat> What, what, did, what did Todd mean by God uses technology for his own glory? Why would God need technology? Well, he uses, he? he uses technology to work through people because um, his people are those who bring the message of his son to the world. And you could do that through technology now. I'm actually – I mean if you think about it, you can talk to anybody in the world almost at any time. Um, for any reason, with very little cost. So if I wanted to talk to somebody in China in their own language about the gospel, I could do that, and I do do that, and uh, a lot of people do that. So there you go. Okay. To me, that sounds like people using technology to spread the word. I, I was interpreting like you um, saying God like, interacts with our devices to talk to us that's oh. no i don't think god us. needs powerpoints to get his message across through through us he does this through us <laughs> and yeah so we the are. guy asking oh sorry well yeah the, i mean the eschatology question there oh is it you reverend hey what's up yeah i mean there, there's no way to answer that right everyone's gonna use scripture and say look i'm using the bible and then everyone else is also gonna say well yeah look so am i so, I mean, there's there's no way, I guess, until that moment happens, then everyone, if we still care, can be like, oh, look, I was right, or you were wrong. <laughs> Welcome, Reverend. Are you speaking? If you are, just hit the mute button and speak. I'm just listening at the moment. Oh, okay. Yeah, Todd, so what what is your uh, 
best best uh, view on eschatology, <laughs> the short version. Um, so what I believe is that um, the second coming is going to come at uh, any time. He, we will. I, I'm not sure if we're going to go through the rapture or not. Uh, there will be a rapture. I don't know if we're going to go through it. I'm going to go outside, so it might be a little loud. But uh, I think that we will go through the tribulation like Noah did, because he went through the tribulation, but he was saved through it. Um, I think that the Noah's Ark was a shadow. So Jesus Christ will come, and we will go through some tribulation. Um, at the end, we will be raptured out. Um, he will uh, destroy all the uh, wicked. Or actually, the sorry, we will we will reign on earth for a thousand years with Christ. Uh, we will be immortal and glorified. Uh, he will be the king of the world for a thousand years, and then uh, he will, at the end of that, he will recreate creation, and everybody will be tossed in the lake of fire that is not in the kingdom of heaven. That's kind of the uh, gist of it off the top of my head. I don't think about eschatology much, but that's where I pretty much land right now. I wouldn't disagree too much with that. Hello, Brandon. Well, anyone else have anything else to say? Saint, you still there? Are you still speaking? Or Mac? I would just say that uh, when I got saved, I got saved in uh, Reformed Baptist Church, and uh, we believed in amillennialism. And while I was there, they started teaching uh, partial preterism. So I've kind of always been that. All right. Well, if no one else has anything else to say, we can call it a day. Five, four, three, two, one. Well, all right, everyone. Good chat this morning. Take care, Reverend. Good to see you. Um, feel free to stop back by. Welcome to Clubhouse. All right. Later, guys. See you, man.